Well, this morning is one of those holy days that most Episcopalians shrink from. We, as people who tend to be very polite and very kind of proper, find the Holy Spirit to be scary. After all, we've seen what those Holy Spirit-filled people look like, haven't we? We've seen them on TV, and they have their hands up in the air like this, and they seem to be bowing on in strange languages. And quite frankly, for Episcopalians, this seems very, very odd. We like our religion proper. We like our religion to be by the book. Uh, actually, both books, the prayer book and the Bible, of course. Uh, and so we find the enthusiasm of those who are filled with the Holy Spirit to be off -putting. As a matter of fact, I remember one of my early experiences in the Episcopal Church when I was at coffee hour at an Episcopal parish near my college. And I was in a conversation with two older gentlemen, one of whom said, you know, last week in New Mexico, I saw a sunset that was so beautiful, it was practically a religious experience. To which the second man said, well, I do hope that if you've had a religious experience, you'd have the good taste to keep it to yourself. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's how most Episcopalians are. But I have news for you. By virtue of your baptism, God the Holy Spirit dwells within you. You have been made regenerate by water and the Holy Spirit, and you have become a new creature. And God the Holy Spirit desires to inflame in you a deeper passion and love for our Lord Jesus Christ. We are Trinitarian believers. Next week we'll have to say the Athanasian Creed because it will be Trinity Sunday. But please be assured that we believe in God the Father, and we believe in God the Son, and we believe in God the Holy Ghost. And we can't just pick two out of three. We need to be Trinitarian Christians. And so it is, we need, as we've been doing for nine days, praying that novena, we need to understand that God the Holy Spirit desires to inflame our hearts. That image, that wonderful image in Acts of the Apostles, where the flames of fire came on the heads of the disciples. That they were so on fire with the Spirit, that they were literally on fire. You know those silly pointy hats the bishops wear? Those are supposed to be flames of fire. That's the imagery. And I, Bishop Michael Marshall, at one time the evangelist and chairman to the Archbishop of Canterbury said that the neat thing about Pentecost was that when those flames of fire were on their head, most likely the individual didn't know it. And in fact, they looked over and said, excuse me, but you've got a bit of flame up on your head. We began to see in each other the gifts of the Holy Spirit if we don't see them in ourselves. But we cannot be the type of member of the body of Christ who refuses to allow God the Holy Spirit to guide us, to govern us, and yes, even to empower us to do the work of the ministry of the church. Because that is who we are to be as members of the church. Not all of us are going to have the same gifts. We have people in this parish with great gifts for the healing ministry. The Order of St. Luke on the third Sunday lays hands and prays upon people. And of course, any other opportunity they have, they are available and willing to pray for healing. It is a great gift. Others have spoken in tongues. Not the kind of babble that you sometimes see, but people who have been given that gift of tongues so that they can interpret the word and speak the word and preach the word so that it can be heard understood, grasped, and embraced. As a matter of fact, today, Michael Bennett gets bonus points for being able to read the geography lesson for the region around all of Israel, Palestine at the time. Those gifts of the Holy Spirit were given to those disciples not so they could show off, but because 50 days after the celebration of the Passover, once again, the Jews come back to Jerusalem. They make a pilgrimage for the offering of the first wheat, the winter wheat harvest 
their first 10%, their tie. Now don't worry, it's not a stewardship story. Oh, they always are, but that's not it. But they are coming to bring their tithes. So once again, Jerusalem is swelling with people from all those countries and all those regions that might better have to read. The Elamites and the Medes and the Parthenians, people from Arabia. All of them Jews or, or convert converts to Judaism. And the Holy Spirit starts the fire and gives them the gift of tongues so that they can preach the gospel to those around them in the languages that they understand. So that gift of tongues. Others have the gift of prophecy. Not the kind of prophecy where if you don't do this, then, then you won't win the lot. I've heard all sorts of bad prophecy. I'm talking about the type of prophecy where we are called back into relationship with God or there are consequences. Others are given the gift of interpreting spirits and discerning spirits. Very important in an age where so many people without even realizing are worshiping demons or at least being tricked by them. It's very important that we do that. All of these things, brothers and sisters, are available to us as the church for one main reason. Because it is our mission and our ministry to bring the world to Jesus Christ and to show the world God's love for them. <coughs> and so it is that God the Holy Spirit empowers us to be Saints. Right? We are to be holy people. Not so that others on the outside can look at us and say, wow, look at how holy they are. Actually, people on the outside don't look in and say such things. Don't be under that illusion. Many of them think we're crazy. But we are to be saints. Not for our own sake, but for the sake of those who are not yet members of the church. We are called not just into relationship with God, but we are called to bring others into relationship with Him by the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Son. And we believe in God the Holy Ghost. All of them equal. All of them God. All of them important for us as members of the church. We know the Father. We know the Son. We had better know who God the Holy Ghost is as well. And then ask Him to help us. Ask Him to enlighten our minds so that we understand the truth. Ask Him to encourage us when things are hard. Ask Him to empower us for ministry so that we can bring others into the relationship that God has extended to us. And maybe most importantly, ask Him to help us to get out of our own way because the one who is stopping us from being saints is ourselves. The world of flesh and the devil may try to trick us, may try to deceive us, but ultimately it's our own sin that prevents us from being really and truly holy. So brothers and sisters in Christ, it's all good news. It's all wonderful news because God the Holy Ghost freely gives to us all that we need to be made into the image of Jesus Christ. The God the Holy Ghost, who dwells in your heart by virtue of your baptism, He may not set your hair upon fire, but He certainly will inflame your heart for a greater and deeper love of God. And in doing so, that love will shine forth will burst out so that we will be examples of God's love to a world that's so different.
desperate and needs it. And then we bring them into relationship with them. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire. Enlighten us with your celestial fire. Start us on fire with the love of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.